As we watch the unrest in Kenosha unfold and wait for updates on Jacob Blake from his family, we're all having deja vu. It looks like the same story of racial injustice and police brutality that we've seen with Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and many more. But my next guest says that there's more at play here. Climate justice, which we know is inextra inextricably tied with racial justice. Steve Horn, a Kenosha native who is the, you know, now San Diego uh, based climate reporter and producer for the Real News Network, joins us today to discuss. Steve, thank you so much for being here. Good to be back and yeah, happy to talk about my, my uh, just a, like a little joke. We, we call it uh, Kenoware and I keep <laughs> telling people it's like all of a sudden Kenoware is, is the center of uh, political gravity in this election season and like a global name all of a sudden. So it's, it's kind of- I think that's why uh, it's so important because you know, yeah. Kenoware is middle America. It's not Chicago, which is also arguably kind of in the middle. It's not New York, it's not LA. And so it's not the kind of place where Trump can point his finger and say, oh, urban populations, et cetera. So I think that that plays a role here. Don't, what do you, what do you make of that? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, you could call it a suburb and it's kind of weird because it's like the, it's the very suburb that he's saying that we need to save, that we need to, it's yeah. a unique suburb in that kind of way because it's a multiracial suburb. It's just where it is is halfway between Chicago and Milwaukee. And yeah, it doesn't really fit that quite fit that urban chaos narrative because of where it's situated. So Can I think, talk, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you grew up there. Can you talk about the history and some of the context again, that we might not be getting from this mainstream coverage of the Jacob Blake story? Yeah. That's been my frustration actually. Is it just kind of, I mean, even, even the thing that I said is seldom mentioned is even like where it is on a map. And now I'll just give a little, a little joke. I mean, CNN had a graphic and they actually showed, Kenosha being about three hours north of a car drive on Lake Michigan. I, I, so I was like, okay, this is very symbolic of how much they actually care about learning about the city itself. They kind of are just positioning it as like just kind of a random ish battle zone. So Kenosha they just is, threw a dart up there and we're like red dot X. It's, <laughs> oh, it's over by there. Lake Michigan. Yeah. It's in Wisconsin. Nobody's going to know. Nobody's going to check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a completely different part of Wisconsin. So, wow. um, yeah, I mean, Kenosha is really important for progressives to know about because, I mean, I think progressives know what happened in the Midwest for in the context of Detroit and Flint and the deindustrialization and the auto industry and all of these union jobs that existed. Well, actually, uh, Kenosha came up came up right alongside those two other cities that I just mentioned. And Kenosha was really important for the history of labor unionism. So in 1933, they had the very first labor union strike within uh, a, a plant, a production facility, and they were the first one to unionize. And two, two years later is when people know more about, which is the Flint strike and the sit down and, and all the, the unionization and sort of everything that came after that, after World War II and did this kind of glory era of workers having decent pay, uh, their wages going up, having a union. That, that was Kenosha too, all the way until 1988. Um, and yeah, at one point, so this was uh, changed ownership many times. The biggest, for the longest period of time, it was called American Motors Corporation. And actually Mitt Romney's dad, George Romney, was the CEO of American Motors Corporation. So yeah, it kind of just shows also just the interesting how politics have changed, you know, I guess Mitt Romney could be an older school Republican in that way, given the, the state of the Republican Party today and, you know, given who his dad was. But I'm not praising Mitt Romney at all, by the way. I'm just I'm just positioning Kenosha it's for same. what it is. Well, the apple kind of <laughs> fell slightly far from the tree, right? His, yeah. his dad, like, ran a company and Mitt Romney grew up to just take companies. Destroy and just companies. Break. Bank I mean, capital. Not, they didn't base the guy from Pretty Woman on Mitt Romney. I, I don't know what. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, all the way until 88. But then what happened is now we, we saw the forces of globalization affect Kenosha. So at one point, the, the 40% of the workforce was working at this, this place. So 16,000 workers. By the way, it's a city of 100,000 now, but back then it was probably about 80,000. So it's grown. And um, Chrysler bought the company. This, this gets the Mitt Romney kind of story, even though it wasn't Mitt Romney. But Chrysler bought the company. And within a year, because they were struggling economically, um, and within a year, they shut down the facility and moved it elsewhere. And a little bit of it was still open. Uh, they're 
they still made the engines there for the next two decades. But then after the um, 2010 recession, those that was another 500, 600 jobs that were gone. So Kenosha was an auto town. It's now, re, it's, I would say it hasn't completely deindustrialized. It's, it's reindustrialized in, in interesting ways that are more in line now with like the stuff that people talk about that's sort of like the, the new neoliberal economy, if you will. Like Amazon has a big presence in Kenosha along the interstate highway. And there's another company called Uline, which deals with a lot of the packaging. It's a, you know, the politically a far right company it has aligned itself with people like Governor Scott Walker, has aligned itself with Donald Trump. They're one of the, they're the biggest, don- so Uline, I just want to put that in, in sort of some context, the packaging company, they are the biggest donor to Republican Party congressional candidates of this cycle. So, and they've also one of the biggest donors to Donald Trump. So uh, the city is, yeah, I mean, these are the kind of things that climate activists, if you go back to the, why I said it's climate justice in this article is, of course, the automobile is kind of the ultimate symbol of what caused where we are today is just the, this nonstop uh, greenhouse gas emissions, pollution, and of course, all the pollution that comes from creating all those cars. But then today we have these, you know, of course, packaging involves like producing plastics and all these kind of materials that are being denounced right now by the climate movement as we need to stop producing all of this stuff. We can't, you know, the, the fossil fuel industry has moved towards plastics production as a lifeline to keep itself relevant. And you know, over the decades, uh, it's been you know, different rebranding of that industry. And of course, Amazon is the kind of the ultimate new symbol of the company that greenwashes itself and says we care about climate change. Oh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. How does Amazon coming to on the scene in Kenosha change the nature of the city? Why is yeah. it important? Well, I think it's important because if you look back to the 80s and they look at the wages today, they haven't really, first of all, they haven't really changed. So it's like three decades of wage stagnation. Second of all, they have no union representation. So Amazon is able to do its model where they drive their workers into the ground. If you can't, if you can't take that kind of work, you just you leave, basically, you get fired. Their, their uh, infamous quota system that they're always being watched and have to move everything through those uh, fulfillment centers so quickly. And um, yeah, I mean, Amazon, what, what do they do? Amazon, we all know we, we buy stuff from Amazon. It goes in a truck or goes on a plane and it comes to us. I'm, I mean, it's just, uh, it's sort of, that, that, that's kind of what it is. I mean, it, it's, it's. I want to go off Amazon. I'm like going on a diet of actual, th- you know, you think I really want to go off. It's hard to I escape. Want, yeah. I want to pull out my Alexa. I don't want to. And I, I did pull out the Alexa. So one, one, you know, it's addictive. These things, you push a button and it's there the next day. And why I got to right. go to the store and catch coronavirus. You know what I mean? It's just- now, now Walmart is uh, joining the, the fun in that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just become that kind of I economy. I think Walmart. Walmart. Sorry. <laughs> Walmart yeah. sucks. I never went there when I lived in New York, not to get off on some weird ta- tangent, but I moved and there's a Walmart and I went in there and like, there's a lot of cheap crap there and cheap stuff and the groceries are inexpensive, but it's right next to things that should be cheap and are like just a little price gougy. You know, something that should be like about $6 is about $9. And then the quality of everything is shitsville. I don't, un- it's just like, I can't even get my mind around Walmart and how bad they're fucking everyone. Excuse yeah. Well, friend. no, that's all right. I mean, yeah, Walmart of <laughs> course was the, the tar- before Amazon, Walmart was the target of a lot, you know, the progressive large par- swaths of the progressive move for a lot of the same reasons as Amazon is now. And it's not like Walmart has really changed. It's just, I think that there was some fatigue over trying to target Walmart as they've gr- grown kind of like a cancer throughout society. So, I mean, yeah, it's kind of that type of economy it changed to the other thing I was going to say is, uh, there's, it's grown a lot. Like, it's not like, so I said, it's reindustrialized. It's like, it's become more suburban, if you will, but that has also meant more, instead of industrial town, it's become more of a, a mix of a suburban, kind of a bedroom community. Cause I said, it's, it's in between Chicago and Milwaukee. So a lot of people work in either two of those cities and maybe some of those jobs are higher paying, but what happens is then Kenosha has a service sector and those jobs pay even lower. So you might work in a movie theater, you might work at a you know, small restaurant or something. So it's like wages have not gone up in decades. And I think that probably I'm guessing that a lot of those jobs, and I don't have like statistics in front of me, but a lot of those jobs are people of color working in those jobs in Kenosha locally. Not, not all, definitely not all, but I mean, yeah. So it's just this, this cycle of 
sort of the, the history that that uh, I laid out is sort of I think that people in, people in the climate movement need to like understand that that climate issues are not only sort of like oh there's a a pipeline in my community or there's not there's a power plant that we're fighting against which by the way there there is there was a power plant in Kenosha since the 80s as well as it grew a coal fired power plant that just closed down two years ago and it was um, that that was something I neglected to put in my article but but basically uh, that was a case of the coal trains passed right through low income people of color communities uh, going uh, I guess north to south and the same they're still going north to south even without the power plant the power plant has just moved to a city that's two <laughs> cities north of Kenosha and it's still these coal trains that are spewing coal dust in communities so yeah it's okay my brain is in all these different areas so i want to pummel you as you said earlier or what did you say uh put you on the stand or something uh, uh about, <laughs> interrogate, me. interrogate you with all these questions um so in terms of the pr and the look of what's happening in kenosha it seems that trump is using say even you know i have an image here that i've been putting up um as we've been chatting this image of you know one of the the demonstrations in in Kenosha it seems like he's saying hey look this is coming to a suburb near you because blacks do, do you know what I mean like he's using the Kenosha thing to be the example of a Biden's you know this is what it's going to look like under Biden can you talk a little bit about that what you see in terms of the messaging yeah I mean I I kind of feel yeah I do feel I mean I do feel he's done that I feel like he's in a way, he has never. I don't think he's ever used the term directly with Kenosha as a suburb. But you're right that he's he's hinted at it in these ways, like when he came to Kenosha on Tuesday and he did his little tour of the the area that was badly destroyed, um, and you know, basically brought those people in as pawn chips at the thing as symbols of here. Are, here's an example of uh, under a Biden administration, your small town. America will be destroyed. You'll notice that uh, the, none of the small business owners, even though the uptown Kenosha area, one of the one of the critiques was that the Kenosha police did not protect this uptown Kenosha area, which is predominantly, you know, I, I would say, like even disproportionately, uh, mm -hmm. black-owned businesses, right? Like compared to the rest of the city, it's it's, it's sort of an epicenter of those businesses, and they they, they were basically wow. saying, of course, the Kenosha police let this. Part. I mean, this is this is a real critique in the city is that they let this part burn down because they probably wanted it to anyway because they want to gentrify this part of the town. And so Trump, he goes to that area. That's where he did his little tour. Then the people he brought in to his press conference, none of them were. There was no black people from that part of the business. So I think you're right. I mean, that's the without saying it. I mean, that that's sort of what's what's being shown. And then, then of course, that that thing that he did, there was also, I think, uh, a couple of people from the black community that were trying to ask a question who got completely cut off by Trump. And yeah, I mean, that was definitely a display of exactly what you're talking about. And that's the message they're trying to send. If you look at the most recent ad that he did, that's how they're trying to position Biden as sort of, uh, yeah, I guess they're, they're kind of equating like Biden with all of that stuff with this sort of huge dog whistle. It's so crazy because if they're saying Biden, you know, if Biden gets it, it's not like Biden's like, I'm gonna cut the police force by 50% and put all that money into community, whatever. You know, he, he's not saying that, first of all. But if they did do that, then this stuff that you're seeing in Kenosha would not be happening. I mean, yeah. It's no one's making the logic. Kenosha, yeah, there's a really good article in a, a publication called Injustice Watch, which is based out of Chicago, so pretty close to Kenosha. And uh, they did an analysis that I've never seen before. So the, the budget in Kenosha is actually 33% police. And I do want to say, if you look at what Trump actually did in Kenosha, he's, he guaranteed a million dollars for small businesses. But I consider what he did to be a perfect example of the Naomi Klein shock doctrine, which is he's going to give $38 million of federal money to the police, which is like the very perpetuators. Like the, the root of this very issue is a violent police incident that well, we're, it's a miracle that Jacob Blake didn't die based on what they did. So, I mean, it was basically an attempted murder, you could say. And yeah, I mean, they get more money. Somehow they come out ahead of it when they're, 
they're the culprits of the very, you know, none of this would be happening in Kenosha if it wasn't for that initial incident. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's really been talked about that way yet, but that's going to be the final outcome is a million dollars in, in income or sorry, in like federal money is going to go almost nowhere for what the community actually needs. I have a, also a feeling that, you know, that business money is not going to the black owned businesses. I'm just going to guess. Let's just see if we can follow up journalistically, but that's yeah. my hunch. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll, or even yeah. the women owned businesses. I mean, most of the money that's coming out of the government right now is going to like the oil industry, which is mm-hmm. mostly white guys. Pretty yeah. Much. I mean, I actually, the way I see it, just kind of understanding the culture of uh, Kenosha. Yeah. I think that it could get kind of like sort of ugly with, with scrambling for whatever, however the money, if a million dollars just doesn't go that far, I could see it. Yeah. I, I can't see it playing out very uh, nicely <laughs> politically. Cause I mean, it's not that much money and people are gonna, yeah, I'm, you know, some might not even be as badly damaged as others. and might just say, Oh, well it's a pot of money. So yeah, when you only give that little, I don't, I don't think it can lead to, very good outcomes. And of course, the community, well before even this happened, could have used more federal support and dollars. And, and I will say, like the mayor and a lot of people, the critique of the kind of city at large, like this underdevelopment, is the, the the leadership in the city and the county are, have just been very complacent and kind of let things get to where they are. So this was uh, a lot of people see this as like a long time coming. I know there's a a black uh, county supervisor. Um, his name is Davon Hallman. Uh, so he was a county supervisor for almost 10 years. There's a lot of videos you can, if you go to his Facebook page, you can see him talking about how Kenosha was like a Ferguson in the making because of all the conditions. So he kind of like was previewing that something like this will eventually happen. He, pro- he probably got on the, you know, said it maybe five, six times. So if you go to his Facebook page, Davon Hallman, you can definitely see that people, some people, you know, people in the black community, I would say, you can see this reflected in a lot of articles that came after are not surprised that something like this would eventually materialize in the way that it has. As you just showed us throughout the course of this conversation, it's a complicated process to understand the connection between climate, economic and racial justice in Kenosha. How can we cl- include climate justice into the conversation without it seeming like we're distracting from what appears to be the driving force here, police brutality and, and, and racial bias. Yeah, well, I think that the, if we see climate change more as like an economic issue, which is I think what the climate justice and the environmental justice movement tries to do is not just fight against pollution or not just fight against projects, but actually just be part of the social justice fabric of movements. It's like you're not trying to supersede it, you're trying to like include it as part of that thing. You're not trying to say, oh, and I think a lot of times climate people will say, oh, it's the most important issue ever. Like everything else is distraction because like our civilization is going to end. Well, if you really believe that, then you need to like, as, a, as someone who cares about- I did think I just said that yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. I, by the way, I agree with it, but the only way that you're going to get people along for that ride is be a part of the stuff that they're that they care. I mean, you're not just like doing it out of convenience. It's like, they are very much related in this kind of incident. Like I will, I will say like that the, the economic history of Kenosha is also like an environmental history and it's a, it's a history of industrialism. And of course, industrialism equals climate change. So it's like, I think that in Detroit is a, is a really good example. Grace Lee Boggs, just like as a parallel city that's bigger than Kenosha, but Grace Lee Boggs, the famous civil rights um, activist uh, who passed away, few years ago several years ago but she directly was saying okay we can't like we don't want to remake what detroit was because it was completely unsustainable from an ecological point of view we need to reimagine what detroit was she started doing these like community gardens and like getting getting people to like create a different detroit and and getting them involved in civil rights activism and i guess also climate justice activism and all that and it was it's a multiracial type of thing that she was doing in Detroit. And I think that that's sort of a good model. And of course she was very much, I mean, in, in the sixties, another example is uh, in Detroit, she was saying uh, yeah, she, she really believed in like what happened with, at that time, which was kind of Kenosha ish, probably even bigger though, which is uh, quite a bit bigger, which was like the burning down of buildings and, and it got violent in the, in the sixties in Detroit. Uh, the But she's saying in, in the aftermath is, she, she considered that a rebellion. And, and she, I keep saying is uh, w- w- the whole, con- this whole conversation we're having about Kenosha now is like, was it, vi- is violence good or bad? Uh, w- what, yeah, are we going to bring law and order to Kenosha kind of thing? And I think that 
it's kind of unfortunate. I think the the Grace Lee Boggs way would be, uh, you know, we we need we can't just have like a rebellion. Like when she when she talks about revolution or like a you know a, a different society, it's like an evolution. It's doing things differently. It's kind of talking about ourselves, changing ourselves as a community. I think that she's she. I think that paradigm of uh, rebe like rebellion versus like this evolution or revolution. That's that's and what I'm trying to do. What you have to do, oh, I'm just saying, is uh, instead of rebelling, you have to create the new. And exactly. I think that's where she was going, and, and it's a beautiful exactly. I mean, yeah, yeah, and I think that I think that I hope that um, I, and I do see. I just want to give a kind of a positive message for the first. Kenosha is also not a um, not a place that has a lot of activism. This is pretty unprecedented, and I think that. A lot of th this moment woke a lot of people up who who kind of maybe were conscious of of these things, but just weren't doing a lot about it. Kind of just knew, or maybe kind of followed it in the news, but weren't acting. I know that I was. There's a group that exists now called. Uh, there was kind of a more generic. Uh, I would consider it like a pretty lame group called Recovering Kenosha, which is kind of treating it like it was like a hurricane or a natural disaster. In response to that, people were saying, "No, we need to insert racial justice. We need to insert social justice into this conversation." So. Th they created a new Facebook group. It's called Recovering Human Rights in Kenosha. It's actually over 600 Beautiful. people. Which is, it's a lot of people in Kenosha. That's I mean, a lot of people in Kenosha. How did you lose your accent, by the way? Kenosha. How did I lose it? Yeah, you don't well, have that, it. That, that, that accent you did is more like northern Wisconsin. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I was just... <laughs> Kenosha does have it. its own, though. Yeah. I it's have some weird. relatives over in uh, Wisconsin that we see every it, so often, and I just love talking to them. <laughs> you do a good one. I could never even try that accent. Yeah, it's a little bit different in Southeast, but it's it's got its own little flavor. It's kind of more Chicago land type of accent. Steve Horn, climate based uh, climate reporter and producer for the Real News Network. Thank you for joining us. A final follow up and maybe a more personal question based on something I saw you post on Facebook about how having something we're hearing these things happen, and then I lived through. Um, a lot of civil unrest in New York, right down the street from my house in Brooklyn. It was like right there. Can you talk about the effect on you? You've been connected personally to a mm -hmm. number of different things that are happening in our world that have, are these sort of pinnacle events that become the head of the news. Talk about just, would you mind sharing with our audience sort of what you shared on Facebook and, um, and how you're, how you're able to process this stuff? Sure. Um, yeah. And it's so basically I'll just say like the, it's a, the, the worst, what I consider to be like on par with the worst part of this was what happened the two days after the police shooting, just because I think it, it sim symbolized very bad things with, with what the, the far right and this militia movement thinks it can do and that it was allowed to do it, which was that double shooting, or I guess three people shot, two people killed. That actually took place really close to where, literally, that was the street I grew up on. It was just several blocks down, uh, Sheridan Road. Wow. Which, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I know that area well. Um, it's really close to literally, like, around the corner, basically, from where I went to my uh, childhood synagogue. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's very, like, jarring to, to be watching that live on, like, these live streams. And it was, like, this battle zone. And I actually was watching live when the shooting took place. And I was just like, what? whoa, this is really, oh, my God. And then I called my mom, who lives, obviously, still, my mom still lives there. So I called her panicking. She happened to be sleeping and then kind of coming full circle. You're I like, mom, look outside. There's a riot. <laughs> There's a riot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just I said, be careful because, I, you know, people were I just, they're shooting. I didn't know, like, what the details were of the shooting, but there was, the shooting was live. And, of course, within hours, people figured out even who the guy's name was. And yeah. then by the morning, we, we knew who the guy, the 17-year-old uh, Blue Lives Matter fanboy, we knew um, uh, who he was, the militia. We knew that he was came there with the militia right. type group summoned there, but yeah, I mean, so what happened is I find out the next day that the one of the, the young people shot, um, Anthony Huber, was a good, basically the best friend of my cousin, and I don't, I don't talk to my cousin like every day or anything, but I mean, I grew up with this cousin. I, I do not know Anthony Huber. I haven't lived in Kenosha since 2008, but it was still like, wow, this is like it's really close to home kind of thing. And of course I, when I see like stuff burning down and I see all these, so it's action, it's, it's like, it's, it's not just like, it's, it's, not, really it's, 
<laughs> it is. Yeah, exactly. So it's, that it's happened not, to me as well when I was, you know, in Brooklyn and we were watching things get smashed and bashed and written. And, and um, it was like, oh, that's where my baby took little baby dance class. <laughs> exactly. I mean? took, yeah. And it's your people. This isn't happening to somewhere else, someone else, somewhere else. This is happening to everyone. And, um, exactly. And I, I would say, you know, my, my message is um, hopefully like people nationally will take their lead from what, and because what I was saying before is there are people who care and are trying to create something new in Kenosha. I um, mean, unprecedented, I would say, for the, the number of people who are now plugged in and want to, I see people on this Facebook group. This isn't, this is not a Kenosha thing. It's like, they're talking about like, you know, we want to read Howard Zinn. We want to, we want to like learn what the, like what, what just took place and why mm -hmm. that's just not really like, oh, a thing. they can watch our show waking up. With <laughs> exactly. we go. Yeah. <laughs> Check out the real so, news network and you can find. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I think that, um, yeah, I would say, I would just hope that national people, I know a lot of people are going to say, oh, well, it was good to smash. I mean, it was justified to smash in the build uh, to burn down the buildings and all that. It's like, I think a lot of people locally just don't really agree with it. There's, if you look at the See, number here's the question, who's smashing and bashing these buildings? Are there any, is there, there any are stats and uh, what's, uh, first of all, there are two things that came up to me that were a little bit alarming. What um, about the was, outside actors that always do it? There was a lot of people, the, the, over the majority, I mean, it's not a super popular thing to say because no one wants to blame the outside agitators, but it was over well over 50% of the people that were arrested by the Kenosha police were from out of state. Of course, the right wing loves to use it, but I think it does symbolize that. I think we have to be well, honest. They're out of state, but I mean, over the course of history, like they've been, you know, let's, we, we're not naive, at least here on this show. And I'm sure you're not, you work at the Real News Network. Like we all know that these movements are infiltrated and burning That's true. Down, That's burning true. down black businesses seems like That's right true. in line with what, you know, these infiltrated movements would want. Exactly. To yeah, exactly. What black or, or, person in Kenosha has like a flamethrower that they're just sitting on waiting for, you know what I mean? It exactly. Just, if, and if you look at the, there's another thing, there's like the, the alcohol, tobacco and firearms, ATF uh, release, did a press release yesterday. And I think like they have like seven different photos of people doing arson um, in Kenosha last week. And six of the seven are, are I think were, were white people. So of, of the, of the actual pictures that they. Put those got, images up. We got to get those all over the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I think uh, so, yeah, it wouldn't be a popular thing among some because it prob probably shows some people in like Antifa and that kind of thing. But I, I think that that, that can discuss. My, well, of course, they're going to wear Antifa clothes because they're trying to make a boogeyman look. Oh my god. Yeah. I mean, I, I think bottom right. line. Is, bottom line is, I think that um, we need to listen to what what the people are asking for, both in the black community and we'll say in like the social justice minded white community. By the way, there's there's the largest um, minority population, or the, yeah, I guess it's the largest people of color uh, population in Kenosha is actually Latino and, and combined it's over 20% of Kenosha is, is those two, which is pretty big for a Wisconsin city. But I think we need to listen more to what the people of Kenosha in the social justice community like want. And I think what almost all of them have been saying, I have only met one person who, who supports um, in of any racial background who supports the, like the burning down. I've, I've talked to a lot of people uh, locally in the past week and a half. So I mean, it's just something to keep in mind when we engage in those debates. Burning down and not do it. Like, you know what I mean? There's a theory. You can support the theory of it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we could talk forever, I think, but Absolutely. Uh, we're kind of out of time. So, Steve, I look forward to having you back on the program. I'm really glad that you are a regular here. Uh, Steve Horn, climate reporter and producer for the Real News Network. You can find him on the internets on Twitter at Steve A. Horn. Steve, what's coming up on the Real News? Um, well, I'm actually working on a lot of stuff to on the police, I guess, like learning, learning more about doing stories that haven't been covered yet about the Kenosha police. So I'm kind of taking a little bit, a slight break from climate stuff just to look into this city, this random city that I happen to have grown up in. And so that, that's something to look out for in about next, like several days, I would say next week. All right. Well, come back on the show. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll talk about it. Thanks Let's a lot. It. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.